Luke writes about Jesus now on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Now most of us don't know anything at all about leprosy. But it's a horrible bacterial disease that affects the peripheral nerves and the upper respiratory tract. Untreated leprosy can permanently damage your skin, nerves, limbs, and eyes. The outward sign that someone suffers from leprosy are all the lesions that show up on a person's outward body. Contrary to popular belief, leprosy does not cause body parts to suddenly fall off. Body parts can become numb and diseased, but they don't just fall off all of a sudden. A person who is treated is no longer infectious after two weeks. And most people don't get leprosy because 95% of us are immune to the disease. Dr. Paul Brand, who treated leprosy patients for decades, says, Thank God for the pain. <laughs> I bet you had never thought you would be thankful for something like that. He says, I can't think of a more valuable gift than pain for my leprosy patients. Because after training as an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Brand spent most of his career in India, where he made the dramatic discovery that the cruel disease of leprosy that causes missing toes and fingers, blindness, skin ulcers, facial deformities, all trace back to a single cause, painlessness. Leprosy silence, silences nerve cells. The result is its victims destroy their bodies bit by bit, but they can't feel the pain. Yet these lepers felt another kind of pain. Because you see, in Jesus' day, the leprosy was the most dreaded disease. Leprosy was used to describe a number of diseases that disfigured people. To be told that you had leprosy was a death sentence. First, the blotches would show up on your skin that eventually turn into lumps. Eventually, an affected person would be blemished beyond recognition. The disease would damage the extremities, like fingers and toes, which would become numb and literally rot away. It was highly contagious, you know, if you were able to get it. So you weren't supposed to be around healthy people. The stench of decaying flesh and grotesque features kept other people at a distance. If you were a leper, you had to leave home. You could no longer be around family and friends. You were not allowed to get within 50 yards of another person. If you got too close, then other people were allowed to pick up stones and throw them at you. So you could get stoned to death. And there were Old Testament regulations about the disease, such as this one. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothing, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and wherever he goes, cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone outside the camp. So a leper was a sick, lonely, rejected person who only had death to look forward to. Can you imagine never being touched again? Never being hugged again? Never having a shoulder of a friend to lean on? Not being able to kiss somebody that you love? That's what these ten men had lived with for years. Their sickness made them unlikely friends, 
nine Jewish lepers had accepted a Samaritan leper into their group. And if you know anything at all about Samaritans and Jews, they did not get along. This fact shows that these ten together were together that even misery wants company. They shared a hopeless situation. Before God sent Jesus our way, we were in a hopeless situation. Without Him, we didn't stand a chance. Nobody else could touch what was wrong with us. Isaiah describes our leprosy this way in Isaiah chapter 1. Ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a breed of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and have turned their backs on Him. Why you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart affected. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. He's talking about the spiritual leprosy of sin. Sin destroys your life. It's a disease that begins in your soul and it works out into every part of you. You know that you have it and other people can tell that you have the sickness. It makes you unclean. It's uncleanness shouts through your life. It creates unhealthiness in you and distance in your relationships. It numbs you to the truth and it loads you up with guilt because it's outright rebellion against God. It's rebellion against the way that you were made. It causes all kinds of misery and yet so often we refuse to return to the only one who can do something about our condition. I hope that's no longer the case in your life because Jesus came to change all of that. It wasn't so long ago, Paul writes in Ephesians 2.1, that you were mired in that old stagnant life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live. You filled your lungs with polluted unbelief and then exhaled disobedience. We all did it. All of us doing what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. All of us in the same boat. It's a wonder God didn't lose his temper and do away with a whole lot of us. Instead, he says, immense in mercy and with an incredible love, he embraced us. You know, he, he grabbed hold of our leprous life. He took our sin dead lives and made us alive in Christ. He did all this on his own with no help from us. And so allowing Jesus Christ to hug your soul will heal the sin disease in your heart. Until you let him do that, you'll continue to live in the misery of your condition. You see, what you hold too tightly will de determine the course of your life. If you're holding on anything besides God, that says you love misery more than Him. You cannot keep that misery from shouting inside of you. You can't stop it. The only one who can silence misery is God Himself. When you get tight with God, He can heal the condition behind your misery. That's when something much better than misery moves in and takes its place. And his name is Jesus. Jesus came to remove the whole misery of sin and to give us a whole, clean, new life. So the misery of these men got the best of them. Instead of shouting, unclean, unclean, as Jesus entered their village, they stood at a distance and cried out in misery, Jesus, Master, have pity upon us. Their disease had kept them at a distance from people. Even now, it was keeping them at a distance from God. Their disease had so infected them that they wondered whether God wanted anything at all to do with them because nobody else did. And many people wondered that same thing. Does God want anything to do with me? And so they begged him for mercy. 
But you know, Jesus doesn't let any kind of leprosy stand between you and him. Luke reports in an earlier occasion where a leper falls to the ground before Jesus begging to be healed. And we're told there in Luke 5.13, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. I mean, this man hadn't been touched, touched probably for years. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Jesus is able to touch any untouchable part in our lives. He is more than willing to do something about our sin problem. When you open yourself up to his cleansing power, the results are immediate in your life. Jesus heals the grip that sin has on you. If you let Jesus get a hand on your sins, it will change you. You'll be a brand new person. Now the law stated that when a leper believed they were healed of leprosy, they were to go to the priest who would verify that yes indeed you were healed. And only then could they return to their life. Go back to the, living with their family, associating with other people. And so Jesus tells these ten untouched men that they're good to go to see the priest. Well, they start looking at their arms and their legs and anything that they could see and it appears nothing has changed. They, they all still see signs of leprosy. So he tells them to exercise faith in his healing power that as they go to see the priest, they'll be healed. And so because they wanted to see their family and regain their lives, they went. And Luke says, as they went, they were cleansed. When you let Jesus get involved in your spiritual disease, something will happen. Outwardly at first, it may not appear like things are changing. Too many people walk back towards their disease when God doesn't fix their outward problems right away or instantly eradicate their struggles. But when you do what Jesus tells you to do, your life is going to change for the better. It might be an inward change in your heart before it's an outward change in your life. As the lepers did what Jesus said, they were cleansed. Nine of them hurried off to see the priest because they wanted to get their lives back. Only one of them came back to thank Jesus. And Luke lets us know he was a Samaritan. He's the last one you would expect to be grateful. Sometimes the only interest people show in God is because they're desperate to get their outward problems fixed. And when their problems are solved, they go on as if they don't need God anymore in their lives. So are you coming to God because you want to feel better or because you realize you need Him? All ten of these men were healed physically, but only one of them became whole. Only one of them was healed in his spirit. All ten got their leprosy taken care of, but only one found freedom from misery. I can tell you what happened when the other nine went home. This is what I'm about to describe to you is human nature. They went home with visions of what life had been like before, at least what they thought it was like before, because in their mind, everything was perfect before they got leprosy. Their wives were always complimentary. Their kids were always pleasing and cooperative. They were willing to do whatever they asked. Their job was exactly what they wanted to do. It was always fulfilling. Every meal on the table was delicious. Every day was a carefree life with no problem. It was going to be that way, they're thinking now, because they had their life back. But do you know what probably happened after they'd been home? A couple of weeks, maybe, if even that long? They forgot what leprosy had been like and what God had done for them. Reality suddenly hit them square in the face as they remembered what she was really like, how annoying Junior can sometimes be, why they had thought about getting another job, how the menu wasn't always that good, and when it just seems like life is filled with one problem after another. Their leprosy was gone, but misery was still very much a part of them. Their bodies were fine, but their spirits were bound. 
An old Latin proverb says, nothing ages more quickly than gratitude. John Cheever says, the main emotion of the average adult American who has all the advantages of wealth, education, and culture is disappointment. God gives us so much, and yet, many times we're still so miserable. We're focused on all our disappointments rather than what he's done for us. As a result, we're ungrateful, unhappy, and undeserving of what we've received. Instead of being grateful, have a grateful heart, we have a grumbling spirit. To hear us talk, you would, would even know that God had once done a healing work in our lives. Don't be like Jimmy Stewart. In the Civil War movie, Shenandoah, Jimmy Stewart plays the widowed father of a large family farm. He's a cranky man with a keen sense of self-sufficiency. As the film starts, he prays before each meal, only because his wife asked him to before she died, but it's a testy prayer. He prays, Lord, we cleared this land, we planted it, we plowed it, we harvested the crops, we fixed the food, we worked till we were dog bone tired, none of us would be here if it weren't for us, but thank you anyway. Amen. So our lips may move and our bodies say thank you to God, but our spirits can still be bound and ungrateful. Do you remember the life that he saved you from? Or have you forgotten? Do you realize how blessed your life really is? Maybe you don't realize how good you've got it. For the most part, in this country, we're sheltered from the harsher realities of what most people in our world face. We need not grumble and live in misery when we can be grateful for the life God has given us as a gift. Ann Voskamp says, our fall was and always has been and always will be that we aren't satisfied in God and what he gives. We hunger for something more, something other than God and his gifts. The lie is, I'm a victim of my circumstances. The truth is, my circumstances are opportunities to experience the goodness of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 shares how that comes through. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. He didn't say give thanks for the circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We don't have to like our circumstances, but we can choose to look for the unexpected gifts that God gives us in the middle of them. Paul knows that only when we're planted in the soil of gratitude do we learn and grow and live and thrive. The joy of living is seeing the goodness of God no matter what you're going through. Again, Ann Voskamp says, the heights of our joy are measured by the depths of our gratitude. The leading authority on the study of gratefulness is, is a professor named Robert Emmons. A deeply committed Christian, Dr. Emmons, makes this observation after all of his research. He says, gratitude is one of the strongest links to mental health and satisfaction with life of any personality trait, more so than even optimism, hope, or compassion. He says grateful people experience higher levels of positive emotions, such as joy, enthusiasm, love, and happiness. Gratitude as a discipline protects us from the destructive impulses of envy, resentment, greed, and bitterness. You know, some of the most grateful people that you'll meet anywhere are those who've suffered the most. Maybe the odds of gratitude for us are the same as in this story. You know, one out of ten came back and gave thanks. Maybe only 10% of the people in this, this world are really fully alive. They are the 10% who truly appreciate what God has done for them and is doing for them. As James says, every good and perfect gift is from above 
coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. Maybe only 10% believe that they live every day with a sense of joy and gratitude to God. A grumbling spirit says that we have not yet found wholeness. And so Luke says one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God with a whisper. With a loud voice. One came back to God to give thanksgiving. That's true worship. That's fullness expressed out loud. This leper still had big problems in his life, but that didn't stop him from giving God praise. His leprosy was healed, but he was still an outcast, a Samaritan. He still wasn't reconnected with his family. He still didn't have a job. How was he going to make it? But no matter what, he was grateful. He had a faith that was bigger than being healed. His faith was in the healer and what else he might do. And you can be sure his gratitude opened the door to so much more than God did in his life. Gratitude changes how you see life and live life. A man who was betrayed by his best friend went and asked him, how could you do this to me? You know, who, who was the one who picked you up out of the gutter? Who was the one who gave you your first job? Who lent you money and bailed you out of jail? And his betrayer said, that's true. You've done all these things for me. But what have you done lately? You see, that's 90% of the human race talking. Where are the 10% who live in gratitude to God for what he's already done, knowing there's even more that he's going to do? Peter Larson's favorite story is about a balloonist who likes to make trips over the Alps. He had his whole itinerary carefully planned. And so each day he would start off in his hot balloon. He planned to go to town A, but the wind blew him to town B. The next day he planned to go to town C, but he ended up in town E, and then the day after that, in the next town. Every time he landed, he would say, I didn't know about this place, or I would have landed here. I would have planned to come here. If you want to go from A to B and end up at C instead, can you still be grateful to God for what he has for you there? Or will you live in your disappointment and keep company with misery? Catherine Wolf had a stroke at age 26 and has lived with several disabilities since then. She has learned how to celebrate in the midst of overwhelming circumstances. She tells about her friend Sarah calling with the news that everyone dreads. Her friend Sarah just learned that her father had been diagnosed with cancer. The shock hit them hard, but they decided to do something unheard of before. They threw a tribulation party in their home that same night they got the news. This impromptu party was full of food and friends, laughter and tears, and the prayer throughout was, thank you. Now they were not grateful for the cancer, but they were thankful for the God who wouldn't leave them to face it alone. They prayed for healing and patience and for God's presence to be real and faithfulness for their suffering to be a testimony to God's strength. Sarah's dad survived his sickness and no doubt they had an epic party celebrated. But Catherine says, celebration isn't so different from worship. Worship in its purest form doesn't happen when everything perfect comes together. It's most powerful when everything is falling apart. She says that her and her husband no longer celebrate desired outcomes that may or may not happen like they want, but they do celebrate because she says, if we wait, it just might be too late to celebrate at all. Celebration can be an act of worship, an act of hope, and perhaps an act of joyful rebellion against the fear. She says there's no greater way to turn a pity party 
into a praise party and perspective. Gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. God, you see, is your everyday supply. He's more than all you need and will supply what you need. Do you serve a God who's bigger than your needs? People can tell. The leper praised God in a loud voice. Your life is shouting loudly about your faith in God. If you're going around shouting your misery, you still haven't found wholeness. If your life shouts gratitude, you found wholeness. Gratitude is wholeness expressed. You can't hold it back. So after the leper expressed his gratitude, Jesus said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Do you know what? You can get up and you can keep going when you have faith that makes you whole. The word used here for well means to make whole, to save from, from disease and all its effects. A whole person has not only been saved from sin, they've been healed from living with an attitude of misery, which is a sign of our spiritual disease. Your misery or gratitude is an expression of your wholeness in Christ, one way or the other. Ingratitude is more deadly than leprosy. And gratitude is more healing than all the money that medicine can be bought for. A grateful heart is the healthiest heart in the world. What does a healthy heart sound like? This is what it sounds like, says Paul. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what wholeness sounds like. So how whole are you? Maybe you need to be saved from your sins. Quite possibly, you need to be saved from a spirit of gratitude. Jesus came to heal the spiritual sicknesses in our lives. He came to do even more. The best line in Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas happens after the Grinch understands the meaning of Christmas. And it says, Some say the Grinch's heart grew three sizes that day. That's what happens when Christ gets a hold of your life. It's like your heart keeps expanding with gratitude. Is that true for you? There's a big difference between keeping company with misery and keeping company with Christ. And the difference is a grateful heart. And so on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Setting down for Thanksgiving dinner. It's not often that you see the words betrayed and thanks in the same sentence, much less in the same heart. In the darkest of nights that a human soul has ever experienced, Jesus found a way to give thanks to God. Jesus gives thanks for what's going to break him, and crush him, and wound him, and even kill him. And yet also, because he knows it will bring more joy than the world has ever known. Anybody can thank God in the light. But Jesus, is Jesus teaches us to thank God even in and so here you are today. You're sitting at the Lord's table with Him to receive His greatest gift. It is a time for thanksgiving. Can you give thanks for all He's given you, even the dark nights? Your darkest nights are going to be the place of His brightest light being revealed in your life. 
And so now I'm going to ask you, will you take the cup of suffering and the bread of life and give thanks? I encourage you to spend time giving thanks to God and then to take it.